a webinar on this fine May morning. I am pleased to introduce um, the webinar today. Um, before we get started, I know people will have questions, and I know that our presenters are really ready to answer them. So um, throughout the presentation today, you'll notice that you are all on mute. And throughout the presentation today, if you have questions, um, you can type those into the questions pane at, in the um, GoToWebinar control panel. Um, one question that I know everyone will have is, um, will the slides be available? And they will. Um, the slides and a recording of the webinar will be posted to the Institute website along with some um, other resource materials by the end of today. So look out for those. And be sure to share this webinar with colleagues who maybe weren't able to attend or might like to have this information. I also want to give you a heads up. I hope you drank your coffee this morning. Um, because there are a few interactive pieces to today's webinar, so a couple polls and a couple opportunities that you'll be able to write in your thoughts on a specific question. So please do that. We look forward to hearing from everybody. Um, and for questions that you need to write in, you can use the questions pane for that as well, and we'll read your answers aloud. Um, there are about 30 folks on the webinar today and growing, so um, everybody is on mute and will remain on mute for the whole presentation. Um, I want to quickly, for anyone who's been on a webinar before, I'm sorry because you probably have this memorized, but um, the, this webinar is hosted by the Patient Center Primary Care Institute, which is a partnership that launched in 2012 to get technical assistance, information, and resources out to practices working on the Patient Center Primary Care Home or PCPCH model of care. Um, if you haven't visited our website, which is, it's likely you have if you're on the webinar today, um, but if you haven't looked around, um, pcpci.org, I encourage you to do so. Um, there are a ton of resources organized by PCPCH standard and a library of nearly 30 and maybe more than 30 webinars like the one today, um, recordings that are available for you to watch. You can also sign up for our email list, which will let you know any late-breaking news about institute activities like new webinars or new in-person training events. Like I said, um, the PCPCH program is a key partner for the Institute. The PCPCH program is a set of standards that the state uses to recognize uh, patient-centered primary care homes. The standards fall into six core attributes, which you see up on your screen. You can get more information about the program at primarycarehome.oregon.gov. And um, today's webinar especially Ooh, I don't know if, if anyone was awake enough to see the little animation that we put in there this morning. But um, today's webinar is, is um, very focused on the coordination and integration piece of being a PCPCH, which is important but also very challenging. I am thrilled to introduce our webinar presenter today, Marcel Thurston, in addition um, to being a wonderfully pre pleasant person to work with was originally trained as a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator starting her career in trauma centers on the East Coast and working in outpatient centers. After almost a decade in direct patient care, Marcel spent over six years in public health serving, um, oh, looks like we need to go to the Marcel side. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, and I, now I messed up Marcel's thing and she's so wonderful. Um, Marcel spent over six years in public health serving at the state level in Washington and Colorado. Her involvement in public health focused on nutrition-related policy initiatives as the coordinator of the obesity prevention program and quality improvement and practice transformation as manager of the diabetes prevention program. Marcel most recently worked with Kaiser Permanente in Colorado serving as the consulting project manager for clinical integration. She is currently a primary care innovation specialist at Care Oregon. We also have um, two guest um, panelists today from Yamhill Community Care Organization. Bonnie Corns is the current project manager for the Yamhill Community Care Organization and was previously the community health manager for Yamhill County Public Health. She holds an MPA and a CHES and has been working in public health for more than eight years. She has been part of the groundbreaking work of the Yamhill CCO since its beginning. She helped to develop the transformation plan, the clinical advisory panel, and the community advisory council. Her accreditation work at public health included managing the community health assessment 
and Community Health Improvement Plan. So she's been involved in all the acronyms. Um, Bonnie brings a unique set of skills to the work of the Amhal CCO and provider relationships and feedback. Prior to working in public health, Bonnie worked in the medical laboratory field for 18 years, learning about process and procedures, duplication of effort, and the importance of provider feedback. Jennifer Jackson is our other guest panelist. She is the member engagement specialist for Yam Health CCO. In this role, she coordinates referrals that come into the community health hub. She is originally trained as a certified medical assistant. Prior to coming to the Yam Health CCO, she worked as a lead in the back office of a private family practice clinic for almost 10 years. She helped the clinic with healthcare innovation grants, such as implementing behavioral health into the clinic and managing patient populations with chronic diseases. She assisted in EHR implementation as well as process improvements to achieve PCPCH recognition. So in short, we are in very good hands today. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Marcel to talk about what we're going to discuss on the webinar today. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just taking control of the slides. Let me see if I have them yet. Oh, I think I do. Good morning, everyone. This is Marcel Thurston, and we are honored um, that you are joining us for this hour. Really appreciate it. We know time is very valuable, and so we're going to respect it by staying on time, trying to be as interactive as possible and engaging. Um, we have probably about 20 minutes that I'll be speaking, and then I'll hand it off to my colleagues in the AMHEL for another 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll try to reserve about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. However, Kate, they can answer or I'm sorry, ask questions in the pane at any time, correct? That is correct. So don't hesitate to send them in as they come to you. Awesome. So um, if we do our job well in the next 30 to 40 minutes, um, probably more like 35 to 40, we'll be um, hoping to focus on these three things. So I'll be reviewing staff models and workflows that clinics um, tend to use most often in referring and tracking care coordination. We'll talk about the characteristics that experts in the field highlight when they define care coordination, and then we'll be discussing a few strategies to work with community partners. Um, so I think many of us uh, have the, a pretty good understanding of the why. Um, clearly, we know that care coordination is an essential quality of a medical home which is why it's mentioned in three of the core attributes for the PCPCH recognition. If you're um, honed in on those standards, you know that you'll see care coordination mentioned in the core attribute three, which is comprehensiveness when they speak about medical services and mental health services. They mention coordination in continuity, which I, I think is the fourth core attribute. Um, specifically the written agreement with um, hospital providers. And they mention it again in the fifth um, standard coordination and integration, um, specifically tracking referrals with consulting specialty providers, um, as well as a process to coordinate hospice and palliative care. And then clearly we know, um, being consumers of healthcare ourselves, that this system is complex. So it's lovely and very valuable for patients when clinics are willing to help navigate um, any kind of referral or care coordination. This is uh, a great article from our partners at the University of California, San Francisco in the Center for Excellence in Primary Care. They pulled together a literature review on the best practices for referral and care coordination. And they ultimately kind of focus on four characteristics when they define effective care integration. Um, they talk about patient care that's coordinated, it's continuous over time, it's obviously tailored when it's functioning well to the patient's needs and preferences, and there's a shared responsibility between the caregiver and the patient. The, um, and I think we, they, I think they've actually updated um, uh, kind of compendium or framework in March of 2014, and I believe we included that in the reading list um, that we'll talk about at the end. And then the Safety Net Medical Home also describes effective care coordination in a similar way, and again using forming categories. Uh, they, their 
kind of spin on it is around account accountability, patient support, um, developing relationships and referral agreements, and establishing connectivity. And we'll talk about those, you know, the four that are here on the slide and the four that the Safety Net Medical Home refer to kind of throughout this presentation. Um, so clearly we have a couple different ways that we are um, trying to coordinate care. We More and more we're seeing ancillary services housed under one roof. So within primary care, we're starting to see more integration with behavioral health, a pharmacist, usually there's a nutritionist um, or dietitian, community health care worker, and I'm sure I'm missing other services that you're seeing. Dental probably is starting to become under the primary care roof. And then we're also seeing more and more primary care providers and mid-level being trained in motivational interviewing. So they're starting to offer a certain level of goal setting and intervention. Uh, however, when it's necessary, on the right-hand side, we talk about referring out. So um, then it's very important to develop a network that allows for a standard process for communication in terms of like what's needed on the referral and then a feedback mechanism. And again, this is a PCPCH standard having some sort of agreement with a hospital, a hospice, a mental health service outside of the primary care facility. Um, so just for clarity's sake, um, when we talk about care coordination, we sometimes also hear the word care management or case management. And um, throughout the presentation, we're really focusing on coordination. Uh, and I just wanted, because in this um, next hour, we'll be talking about staffing models and workflows, and so let's just all get clear on the type of staff that we're talking about in those processes. So care coordination, we're talking much more around the referral or transition of um, care management. And typically, it's a non-clinical role, and it's usually um, completed and tracked by staff such as front desk, medical assistants, a designated referral coordinator or an LPN. And when we talk about care management, we're talking much more about a clinical role. So someone who provides kind of more in-depth um, counseling or coaching for someone that may have chronic disease and or um, has social or mental health um, support or needs. And that's often done by a registered nurse, case manager, social worker, or, or health coach. Um, so we are going to take a quick poll, and Kate, you're going to help me out with this. I sure am. Okay. I am here to help. Okay, cool. So the way I understand we're going to do this poll is um, just to be clear which, ta uh, which tasks are performed by care coordinator. Um, there's four, there's five that we're going to read through, and then you'll have the choice when you see the poll. Um, whether this task belongs to a care coordinator or a care manager. So are we ready for the poll? We sure are. Okay. So the first one, a referral coordinator in a primary care practice checks with a health plan to see if it has approved a CT scan for a patient. Is this care coordination or care management? All right. Looks like most folks have their copy today, so <laughs> all right. Hopefully you got your vote in because we're going to move through these pretty quickly. Nice. Okay, we're all on the same page on that one. Let's go to the second question. Here it is. Social worker has a discussion with a high utilizing patient about alternatives to calling 911. Care coordination or care management? Nice. Okay, third question. Front desk staff member emails the emergency department of both hospitals every morning to see if any of the practices patients have been to the ED in the past 24 hours and to get the emergency department record. Care coordination or care management? Stop. 
bestseller. Okay, two more. Excellent. And RN provides coaching on using inhalers for COPD for a patient. Care coordination or care management? <laughs> nice work. Okay, last question. Uh, medical assistant goes over the referral log and contact specialists who have not sent reports. Okay. I'm going to get a drink of water because I'm ready to cough. Okay, thank you. Okay, so clearly we're we're all on the same page. That's awesome. That's really good. So um, let's move along. I want to, before I talk about um, the staffing models, I want to just take another quick poll and ask, um, oh, you know what, Kate, I might have lost control of my slides. Oh, here we go. I want to ask another quick um, poll in terms of what you're seeing. Sorry about that. Um, what would you say is your top barrier when, that you've encountered in doing this work? So where are your biggest pain points when you are trying to either coordinate care or track referrals? Remember, go ahead and use that questions pane to write in, and I can read your answers out loud. If you're talking back to Marcel, she can't hear you. So someone um, said time and resources. Um, tracking referrals is hard. Mental health provider availability is really difficult. Um, lack of a shared technology resource. Anybody have anything different? Finding a specialist that will accept the right insurance. Getting outside mm -hmm. providers to follow up with us the actual tracking process of referrals, um, finding providers to accept insurance again, another vote for time and resources. I'm sure that's the same for everybody. Um, too many patients for two care coordinators and um, no other staff to do the non-RN work, uh, lack of understanding of roles in our practice and cooperation, um, again, just tracking referrals, um, provider buy-in that care managers can do work, um, so the, there are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so we'll probably hit on some, not all of those, and we can definitely have a conversation at the end to address some of those if you don't hear it answered during the rest of the webinar. And then I'm hoping that um, Bonnie and, and Jennifer, you are hearing those as well. Maybe you can answer during your part of the presentation. So I just want to go into... Um, Oh, let's see here. I'm jumping ahead of myself. So let's do. Let's just look at this slide real quick. This is pretty common uh, when we talk about a process pre and post um, referral tracking. So prior to having any kind of system in the clinic, no idea if the patient was followed up with a specialist. There's disjointed care. The PCP is not sure what's going on. Did they go to a super specialist or not? Was it completed? Um, one particular clinic had over 500 open referrals when they did a report looking back over the last year. And then the common story, after they put a referral system in place that's much more streamlined and standardized, referrals are closed in a timely manner and referrals closed is actually defined. Um, at, they're able to track um, if they've received a note back from the uh, referred the provider that they were referred to. The PCP, the PCP and care team are able to follow up on recommendations, and there's a clean process, a clean up process. And we'll talk a little bit about um, some workflows around that clean up process as well. So before we look at those, let's go ahead and look at a couple staffing models. So um, curious to know what you think works best. So in your experience, or if you haven't had an experience, your best guess. What staffing model do you think works best? What's 
you know, most efficient, streamlined, what's the most clean process? Is it when you have one dedicated referral coordinator? We're just going to read through these and then we'll do the poll. So is it when you have one dedicated referral coordinator? Is it maybe when you have a um, medical assistant for the provider who originates the referral and the front desk track? Do you feel like it's most efficient when you have a coordinator and a team or a pod that includes this task amongst other um, tasks that they might have? Or um, some clinics have used off-site referral coordination. So in your experience, A, B, C, or D, when we do the poll, tell me which one you think is the best. Uh oh, my screen went. Hey, Kate, I can't see the screen. Hmm. So you should be able to see the poll results. So, um, I does everyone else see them? <laughs> I see them. So if you're in the audience and you see the poll results, if you could raise your hand on the GoToWebinar, that would be helpful because I can see them. Yeah, other folks have raised their hands. Oh, boo. Okay. I know. Well. That's okay. So I'll kind of tell you what the poll results say. Maybe when we go back to the slides, you'll be back online. So 54% said A, one referral coordinator for seven providers. 15% uh, of folks said B, and MA for a provider who originates the referral and the front desk track. 21% said a pod coordinator who has this task along with their other tasks. And 10% um, said D, an off-site referral coordinator with communication um, via inbox messaging. Awesome. I still don't have my slides up, so I'm going to have you walk me through them. I have them here hard copy, so we'll, we'll make do. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's see if we okay, can cool. get you um, some back. So um, I'm going to move on. And so when we talk about these three, or excuse me, four staffing models, there's definitely, oh, I see it now, Kate, thank you. Um, there is definitely um, room to have any of those four. And the 54% who said A are correct. So what we see is most efficient, most streamlined, cleanest processes when you have one dedicated referral coordinator. And we've seen it best when it's a ratio of one coordinator to seven providers. We've seen it up to 10 providers, and that tends to be a little too much for just one referral coordinator. But the thought process is that you have less hands, one person, so it's um, exchanging um, fewer people, and when you have one person dedicated to the task, they tend to also have a really great knowledge base. So they've either um, established relationships with some of these specialist office, they are aware of maybe wait times of some of the specialist office, um, so like maybe they know that one specialty is out 30 days and another specialty has room quicker. Um, they tend to um, uh, be able to just kind of like know how quickly um, those specialty offices um, get back to them and they also are aware of what's needed. Maybe there's some certain details that one office requires of another office. Uh, it's also helpful if the referral coordinator is bilingual. Um, a lot of them are responsible for gathering needed documentation from the um, staff, sending it, but then there's also a piece of communication with the patient. So um, a lot of the uh, patients will call in and ask where they are in the process, and it's nice if you have someone that's bilingual and can really um, help walk them through um, what the expectations are in terms of next steps. 
and some referral coordinators will, you know, offer, if you don't, you know, hear back from the specialist in X amount of days, you know, contact me. Um, but we've also seen some of these other staffing models, and they can work. They're just not as, as streamlined and efficient. Hey, Marcella, I just wanted to jump in because someone had a really timely question. Is the dedicated yeah. referral coordinator in this model assumed to be a full-time one FTE? Yes. Great question. Thank you for asking. So when we look at additional skill sets, um, we mentioned the bilingual piece. Obviously, customer service skills, both internal and external, is lovely. Um, really want them to um, uh, just be able to um, not only customer service with your um, internal staff and your external specialty staff, but also with patients. Um, having some medical knowledge is not necessary, but it's nice to have. Um, this may be in their work history. However, we <laughs> wrote here not too much because sometimes if it's someone um, that can get pulled, they will. And then uh, if they can just be a good multitasker and have some good project management experience, it can go a long way. Um, a process that you want to really um, consider some major pieces when you're talking about um, establishing a, a good, uh, efficient tracking system, referral tracking system for care coordination. Um, you definitely want it to be standardized across all um, providers. It just requires there, you know, less back and forth and extra time that staff is needed to fill out blanks that weren't completed the first time. Um, you uh, will benefit greatly if you have partner agreements. Now, there can be this can be formal and informal. Um, it can be just a you know a bulleted agreement on um, how we see that we want to. Um, complete the referrals and or um, feedback within 48 hours. It, can, it doesn't need to be anything um, arduous. Um, the number of attempts, so this is really nice to have a standardized process for in terms of not only to the specialist but also to the patient. And it works best if you have some standard messaging and or scripts. Uh, a lot of people will use Excel and, and a track, as a tracking mechanism, and some electronic medical records also have a referral module. So if you haven't, I'm sure many clinics do have EMRs, um, you might want to ask about their, um, if they have that option for referral tracking. And then getting clear on what's considered complete, and then have some cleanup guidelines. So let's just look at a quick um, ideal workflow, and then we're going to look at a cleanup workflow as well. So um, ideal workflow is usually when the provider or a care team member, it doesn't always need to be the provider, um, completes the referral, it's logged into a system, um, the referral paperwork is sent to the specialist, lovely when the patient follows through and goes to see the specialist. And it's also really great when the specialist will send a note back to the clinic, which is often the biggest missing component. And then the notes um, reviewed by the provider, and that's where a lot of clinics will deem the referral close. So this is the ideal workflow. Um, it looks just a little different. You could even detail it out um, more by putting the people, the staff needed for each of the boxes. Um, but this is just kind of a template to, um, for a show and tell to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then we also have seen some um, cleanup workflows. So um, if you haven't been, um, if you do not currently have a referral tracking system in the clinic, then um, they have to kind of go, you know, there was an example earlier about the clinic who went back a year. So you can go back a year, you can go back six months. Um, but really, you just need to, if you have the ability to run a report in your EMR to see what ones are still open, that's great. Otherwise, you might need to do an actual chart review, or you might have another system of a referral log where there might still be some open referrals. And then looking in the chart for the report, meaning the note back from the specialist, if it's there, then officially close the referral. And if there's no report, contact the specialist to see where they are in the process. Um, if, it, if the patient has 
come, then you can request the report, close the referral, and then give it to the, the doc for a review. And if the patient has not attended, you might need to do some outreach to the patient to see if they still want to go. Um, so, Kate, I think we're going to have time at the end for questions. Um, do you want to pause and see if there's any from the audience, or should we go ahead and hand it over to our um, Yam Hill CCO folks? Let's, let's go ahead and have um, our Yam Hill CCO friends talk, and then we'll just do questions at the end. Okay, sounds great. Good morning. This is Bonnie. And this is Jen. And we're from Yam Hill CCO. <laughs> and um, we're here to talk about our referral process for our community health hub. Um, and just to give you a little bit about Yam Hill CCO and um, who we are, um, we're a grassroots startup for our CCO, um, community owned 501c3. Um, there's all kinds of information there on your um, screen on the slide there. But the part that we're going to be talking about today is the community health worker hub. Um, which we actually dropped the worker part and we are now just calling the Community Health Hub. Um, and we work with all these different programs, Project ABLE, Persistent Pain Program, um, the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, and um, the Community EMS Program, um, which is new to us this year, which has just been an awesome addition to our team. Um, so do you want to go ahead and flip the slide? Um, oh, I thought we were going to have our referral form in there first. Let's see. Oh, I can move to that if you want. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Jen's going to talk about the um, kind of the history of how we got to be where we are today. So the first program we're going to talk about is our Family Core Referral Form. We have several home visiting programs within our community. and we were struggling with how to get referrals into the programs and what we found was each program has specific um, qualifications in order to be able to take on a child and sometimes there's capacity issues and all of those things. So we decided for our providers in our community that they have one place to refer any child from pregnancy through five years old that needs a, or that would benefit from a home visiting program in our community into one place. Right now they go into Yamhill County Public Health, but now with the CCO, um, we're going to transition that and they'll come over here. Um, and then the people from each of the programs, which you can't really see the bottom of this form, it lists all the different home visiting programs at the bottom of the form. Anyways, so providers can refer into Family Core, and then the players from each organization meet once a week to staff these referrals, and we can talk about which program would be best benefit um, the family, as well as find out if there's capacity. So that the providers that are referring into a program that's maxed out on their capacity or may not be the best fit for this family. And then after we, and then the next one, yeah, we can go to the next one, that's fine. And then this is our adult referral form. It has a front and back, so on the front it just gets basic demographic information and a little bit about wh what the needs are of the individual and or family. And then, again, they all come in to one central location and we staff them these on Thursdays and we decide which program um, within a community would best suit the client's needs. I don't know if you want to expand it anymore. So do yeah, you we have a screen the back of the form? Yeah, thanks. I was just going to talk about that. So on the back of the referral form for the um, Community Health Hub, we have a brief description of each of the programs that are currently offered and that we currently refer to through the hub. Um, and what the eligibility requirements are so that the providers have a clue as to which programs are which and what's going on. Um, and that's on the back side just for their information. They don't have to choose a program when they refer a client and even if they do, we'll still re review it. And 
see if there are other programs that maybe a client would benefit from as well and try to fit them in with the community health worker, um, try and get them connected to resources. So I, would, I would just want to be um, super clear. So Bonnie and Jennifer, it's almost as if the YCCO is functioning as that referral coordinator and maybe even doing a little extra task in terms of deciding where the patient is most appropriate to get referred to. Absolutely. That's amazing. Okay, and then I just wanted to go back to this slide. Yeah, so um, just recently we found out that Physicians Medical Center, they're one of our largest clinics, they've actually recreated the Family Core referral form and the Community Health Hub referral form in their EHR. And so they're really made it easy for themselves to make these referrals. And we've already seen increased referrals just in the last couple of weeks since they did that. That's great. Yeah, it was really awesome. So this is a way for primary care providers to utilize the resources we have in this county without actually having to know the nitty gritty details of each program. They just can identify this as a family or an adult um, that needs additional resources so they can refer them and then we can kind of provide whatever wraparound services we deem most appropriate. And then of course we loop back with the primary care provider and let them know where it went and what they might hear in the future from each individual program. Each individual program um, feedback loop is unique and some are in development. So are there any questions for us? Marcel, if there was anything else um, you wanted to add, uh, you could do that. And if not, we could certainly jump into questions. We have a few. Yeah, I guess you know I was just gonna um, just say that this is you know one example of um, the benefit of having the CCO and one function that they might serve. Um, Care Oregon oversees four of the sixteen CCOs, and um, the Yamhill CCO tends to be the furthest ahead in coordinating at this level for care coordination and referral tracking. So that's why we had them as guest panelists. Well, thank you. There were know. some specific questions related to that. If I could, if I can mention the first two really quick. Um, of course. Just folks were asking where the funding comes from to start and run this hub, and um, curious if you've used alternative payment methodologies to incentivize. Um, this coordination work and to support the partners who are involved in it. Okay, so originally the Community Health Hub started with the community health workers um, and our model for attempting to outreach to high utilizers and it has really evolved over the last year and a half. Um, originally it was funded, well it still is to this day, um, with Transform what we call transform forward funds, so transformation funds. Um, moving forward, it will probably come out of some of the flex services. We're working on what that might look like. And as far as the APM goes, um, no, we haven't used the APM in that way in our community. Great, thank you. Kate, I'll comment on APM as well. So Care Oregon is starting um, a pilot program in the Portland metro area around um, alternative um, visits. And so I think they're uh, partnering with a handful of clinics to really see if um, when they either enhance or create payment for alternative visit types such as e-visits or um, telephone calls um, by non-clinical staff if that improves in any kind of care coordination and or just overall share of the care type activities. Great, and if you guys didn't have anything else specific, I have a few more questions. Do you wanna jump into those? Yeah, sure. sure. Great, so um, one of them is, um, this is a good one. So. Clarity around the definition of a completed referral. Um, is that a hmm. practice's preference how they define that, or is there some kind of industry standard people are following? 
Great question. I believe it's really based on the um, the clinic preference. And if you go uh, back to the literature review that was done by um, Tom Bodenheimer and his colleagues there at University of California, San Francisco, I think they also talk about that. Um, a lot of clinics will deem a referral closed when the provider has actually seen the note back from the provider. And then it's either designated in some fashion, whether that's, um, you know, a, a standard process that the provider then has a, a signature, um, either in the electronic medical record or somewhere that is noted on the referral log. Great. And then um, someone asked, how are you tracking incoming referrals and closing the loop um, to ensure they've been completed? Do you guys want to talk about that at Ann Hill? Sure. Right now we have just a basic spreadsheet that we're using um, and tracking that way. We're working uh, actually to beef up our feedback loop back to providers um, and working with the community programs that we work with like Project Table and the community EMS to make sure that we're all doing a similar thing and that providers can expect similar reports back in similar time frames. So it's a, that's a work in progress. Um, we're hoping to have the CTO doesn't have an EHR at this moment, um, but we're hoping to do some work with an access database with our new um, business intelligence specialist. Great, and then um, so someone wrote in, um, thank you for that, to note that the PCPCH program does have a definition of a closed referral for the purposes of those standards um, that Marcel was mentioning earlier, and it's when the family um, or patient has been informed. So that's just another sort of definition um, it's specific to the PCPCH standards that we wanted to make sure to call out. Awesome, um, thank you. Yeah, another question um, for Jennifer and for Bonnie. Um, so how do you, or um, you know, so the, the actual knowing where folks can go and, um, and that kind of stuff is, you know, on paper a lot of clinics have, um, you know, referral lists or places where they'll send, send people. Have you done anything around building relationships between some of these groups in primary care or how does that, do you take a lead role in doing that? How, do, how does that sort of happen? Absolutely. Um, I personally, as well as um, our community health workers, go out and visit the primary care clinics regularly um, to try to promote and generate referrals as this is a new pilot project in our community. And then as well as the community partners that we, um, you know, once we receive a referral on a family, the community partners that have resources in our area, um, we also have developed relationships with. So sometimes folks that you get, we get referrals into the hub for um, who ha are having complex health issues and we get a community health worker involved. Just folks have, like, you know, you talk about folks' needs. Like if they don't have food and shelter and clothes on their back, they can't begin to think about diabetes or anything, if they're worried about where they're going to get their next meal, they can't worry about counting their carbohydrates. They're just thankful for having their next meal. So the role of the community health workers is to address some of those, you know, basic needs for folks so then that they can concentrate more on their health. So we have relationships with several of the um, community, part, you know, community resources around to help folks um, be able to get those resources um, more readily. And so the community health workers have worked hard to like some of the food pantries or the places where they can get a free hot meal or clothing or shelter, you know, they have relationships with the local shelters or folks, you know, we have a relationship with somebody at house, the housing authority as well as YCAP, some of those things. We've just had to basically pound the pavement to develop those relationships. That makes sense. And then um, there's one other question. And remember, folks, you can write in your questions in the GoToWebinar questions pane 
Um, or if you have follow-ups to any of the questions that have been asked, feel free to write them in. I'm happy to go deeper or, or longer into any of those questions. Um, someone asked about um, specialists specifically um, and how um, people or what strategies people have used to be successful in getting information back, particularly from specialists. Um, does, do any of you, Marcel or, or Jennifer or Bonnie, have um, specific insights into how people have done that um, successfully? I'll comment and then I'll let Jennifer and Bonnie also comment. Um, just from experience that we've heard, I mean, this, um, we're not on the phone with the specialist from the clinic and having those conversations. So this is secondhand. But what, we're, what our understanding is for the clinics where it works best is typically it depends on the size of the community, right? If you're in a larger community and you, you then have a lot more choices of specialists to refer to, if you're in a smaller community, you don't have as many to choose from. So if you're in the larger and you have a relationship with the specialist, sometimes it's just a verbal agreement, and that verbal agreement actually can stand the test of time, and it actually um, it can work. If it's um, a smaller, and then, you know, and if it doesn't work, then you have other specialists to choose from, and you can try a different um, clinic. If you're in a smaller community and you only have a couple of specialists to choose from, you really need that you really need that communication to work. And so, if verbal agreements don't work, there's maybe there was um, uh, maybe a conversation and you thought that there was understanding of what the agreement was, but that there's not follow through on that agreement. Then clinics will take the next step and have some sort of documented agreement. And again, that can be even a pretty informal documentation. Um, but then, you know, maybe then you have something that you can, your referral coordinator can point to to say, these are the steps I followed and these are the steps we agreed on in terms of um, communication feedback loops. And if that doesn't happen, then maybe they can escalate it. So this is Bonnie. And we ran into that same issue um, trying to get reports for our persistent pain program clients. Um, you know, and it, I don't know, it just always is that question of how are you going to approach them without, you know, pestering them or making them angry in some way, you know, how that goes. But um, again, I think the key to that is to build those relationships to have, um, well, we're lucky enough to have Jen, our member engagement specialist and our community health workers be able to go out and build those relationships in the provider's offices, but um, to build those relationships and be clear up front what your expectations are. And, um, you know, if you are having problems with somebody, try and figure out a way to meet with them in face and talk about what their barriers might be to getting the reports back to you. One of the slides did talk about number of outreach attempts and kind of standardizing that process. And so in that agreement, it's good to say, in terms of expectations, you will, you know, receive a standard email from me to this office, you know, every day until we hear back from you for the next, you know, X days. So you want to make sure that they're super clear so that you don't feel like you are annoying them, like Bonnie is saying, because that was the expectation that was set in the beginning. And um, folks were wondering, does anyone have any, and maybe if anyone out there in Internet land does, um, feel free to, to let me know and, and I can tell you where to share it. But does anyone have any examples of the written agreements um, that have been made, even you know, an example of the bullet point language or, or any examples that we could collect and share with folks? I don't know if Marcel or Bonnie or Jennifer, any of you have um, examples? Kate, I can definitely look to see from what we've collected from some clinics, if we have that, and then get back to you. Sounds good. And then if anyone out there does, um, feel free to send them to, there's obviously the hospital agreement um, that's already on the Institute website, and that's a PCPCH must pass standard. So that example has been out there for a while. Um, but if folks have different sort of agreements with different kinds of uh, organizations, whether it's social service organizations or specialists, 
um, feel free to email them to info at tcpci.org and we can share those with other people who are on the webinar today. Okay, let's see. Let me scroll through. Oh, someone else also shared that um, when they're managing referrals, they contact a specialist office with an Excel worksheet and fax it to them, and then they have time to reconcile and send it back and, and let the clinic know which action was taken. So just another way that someone has, um, awesome. has taken on working with uh, specialists who see a lot of their patients. Um, there were a couple of questions around um, too much work for care coordinators and how clinics could manage that or how people um, don't get overwhelmed when there's so much work to do and maybe folks aren't having that seven um, providers to one referral um, mm -hmm. coordinator sort of model. What suggestions would you have for people who are getting pretty overwhelmed trying to do all this tracking? Mm -hmm. Um, process map it. So I think it'd be um, really important. Well, I think it'd be important to one understand what the ratio is of the care coordinator to provider. So maybe they're over that ten mark. Um, and then the other thing would be really to just get super clear on um, two things. One, maybe the list of tasks that the care coordinator is doing, and see if any of those tasks are um, something that another non-clinical person can take over. And then um, two, to maybe really process map out what, what it looks like when they are doing um, referral tracking. And maybe there's some streamlining that can be done. And that's often, streamlining is often around like standard processes. So, um, you know, is there a standard um, script that they're using for when they need to leave messages or a standard script that they're using when they're emailing that um, they can maybe even generate like an automatic email that goes out. Um, so that can create some efficiencies. Um, and then obviously like standard processes for the referrals. Great, and then um, there's one more kind of, not a tangent question, but it's a, just a, a, on a little bit different of a kind of related subject. Um, and then if you have any last questions, this is the last one. So if you have any other questions for uh, Bonnie and Jennifer or for Marcel, please break them in. And if not, maybe we'll finish a couple minutes early and, and give you a few minutes back in your day. Um, the questions around doing sort of care management and care coordination over the phone um, and what what, if any, tips you have about doing that successfully, I think um, the idea is that people kind of feel like they don't know if actions are being taken or find it harder to to follow up or, or do that tracking. So do you have any specific suggestions around folks who work with a lot of their patients over the phone? Hmm. Can you ask the beginning of the question again? I just want to make sure I understand. Just um, really just things that are happening, you know, people who are working with their patients over the phone a lot. So follow-up documentation, how are they, you know, are they doing follow-up phone calls to close loop? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for the most part, for care coordination or care management? I think it's more of a care management question. Okay. So for care management, we know that it's often hard to track our patients down by phone. Um, so trying to get a really good phone number that you can connect to that patient regularly and or a time um, that really works for that patient, kind of getting maybe clear on that is helpful. Um, otherwise, I think that's when uh, community health workers tend to work um, really well or, or having some sort of way to go to where the patient is if it's more of a care management piece. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a really hard one in terms of um, phone coordination. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if the question is because of the difficulty of contacting the patient and the number of messages that you're leaving. Are you getting anything yeah. from that, Kate? Yeah, I think it is. It was kind of around that, so I think you sort of addressed it. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, so we have a few more. People are waking up here at the very end. 
So once you receive specialist notes back, how do you and they recommend follow up care. How do you handle how do you handle that? Follow up care by the provider or follow up care with the specialist? How do we want to interpret that? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I was going to say, well, what question do you want to answer? Yeah, exactly. Typically a referral to a specialist, um, it can be for um, long-term transition of care or it can be short-term transition of care. So generally a referral can be for several visits. Um, and then the specialist can deem how many times they need to see the patient. So if it's specialist follow-up, um, I think you could still close the referral. It um, would be interesting to see um, if any of your folks write in what their experiences have been on follow-up care and if they keep that referral open or not. And maybe they just document differently. Um, and if, obviously if it's more of a referral is needed, I've seen the patient, the specialist says, I've seen the patient and I really want them to now follow up with their PCP, then clearly the referral coordinator could um, either schedule the patient directly, they would have that um, knowledge on how to schedule the patient and or pass that task along to the scheduler in the clinic. Yeah, and someone suggested that they, they do a, an additional referral at that okay. point to make Perfect. sure that that gets tracked. So, Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So um, thanks to everybody um, for joining the webinar today and for writing in and sharing some of the ideas that you have. Um, the uh, recording of today's webinar and the slides and a PDF of those forms that you couldn't see particularly well on the slides, sorry about that. Um, but a PDF of those will be available um, on the Institute website by the end of today. So you'll see the link right there, but it'll also be emailed to you um, to remind you that it's there. So um, thanks again to our presenters, to Marcel and Jennifer and Bonnie for sharing um, all the great things that they have learned and know. Thank you to everyone who joined who also shared what, what they have learned and what they know. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing some of you at future webinars. We have one coming up on health literacy and one also coming up in June around um, the depression screening and expert for adolescents and some important information about coding um, related to those CCO incentive metrics. So be sure to register for those if those are of interest. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Great. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone.